I can't do the one. Yeah. I want to start tonight's proceedings. Um, I'd like to welcome you all here to the inaugural Seamus Costello Memorial School. This is the first time we've tried to run a two day school in, in, in memory of Seamus Costello. For a long time, there's been the one night lecture, usually down in Newtown Mount Kennedy, but a number of people felt that it needed to be expanded on and to bring sort of inspiration to a new generation for, for, for Seamus' legacy and um, that's what this two day school is about and one of the people who was most behind the school is Sean Doyle who can't be here tonight so he asked me to open the school for him but he sent a statement which I'm going to uh, read out because if he had been well enough he, 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 as you all know he would have been here with us so this is a statement from Sean to launch the school which is um, Sean's words now I want to welcome you all here tonight to the inaugural Seamus Costco School I am disappointed and sorry that I could not be here with you tonight, but I'm equally delighted to see that this Costello School has come to fruition. To honour the only Socialist Republican revolutionary of our generation, since James Connolly, Seamus was determined to have a revolution in his lifetime and work tirelessly towards that goal until his murder at the young age of 38. Dr. Noel Brown's words were prophetic. Little did he know when he said of him at his address in Amherst, Forum in America in 1975. He said that after listening to him for three hours in the afternoon by popular request, another two hours in the evening, that there is no doubt that they will have to shoot him or jail him or get him out of the way, but they won't stop him. Nora Connie O'Brien stated, of all of the pol politicians and political people with whom I have had conversations and to call themselves followers of Connolly, he was the only one who truly understood what James Connolly meant when he spoke of his vision of the freedom of the Irish people. Liam Meadows wrote of the freedom of the Irish people in the People's Republic. It is a fallacy to believe that a republic of any kind can be won through the shackled free state. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. The free state is British created and serves British imperialist interests. It is but a buffer erected between British capitalism and the Irish Republic. Noteworthy that the described British creation, the Free State Committee, took him and two of his comrades out in Mount Joy and murdered them in 1922, and continued their ethnic cleansing of Socialist Republican revolutionaries for years after that. Bearing in mind all the aforementioned historic, historical instances, it can appear on one hand how prevalent the present is at the same time. For example, a generation's physical presence can span many years of history. James Connolly returned home one day from Countess Markovich's house and said to Nora, I have met a fine young man, and that man was Liam Mellows. Nora, in turn, in her lifetime, became aware of Seamus Costello and his belief in her father's courage and devotion to the Irish working class and their freedom. Incidentally, when Liam Mellows summer, was summarily executed and word reached America in New York, Hannah Sheehy Sheffington organised a memorial and one of the speakers was Muriel McSweeney, the widow of the Lord Mayor of Cork, Terence McSweeney. She said, I would rather see them both dead than succumb to the British Empire. It is noteworthy that the courage and conviction denied to a people is still denied to the Republic. James Connolly said, Knowing our history is like a lamp to the feet of the Irish worker in the stormy paths through which he must travel today. Seamus Costello says, We don't own the dead and they don't own us. But we learn from what those who have gone before us, but were still mindful from what their message is applied, and their methods were relevant for the time and the journey we might still have to go on, gaining experience by trial and error of their time. We don't have to live in the past, but it's vitally important we know our history and we forge ahead to reclaim the People's Republic. In conclusion, I would like the Costello School, as it goes forward, to be a vibrant, imaginative, innovative hope challenging us all to break from the old, failed methods of communicating and move to engaging <coughs> young, energetic minds to build a broad front of revolutionaries challenging the mindset of the status quo. As Connolly said, we only want the earth. As was penned as a tribute to Seamus, remember we were born to be free men, not quizzling, not lackey, not slave. And my work in this life is an honour, so take up my courage with pride. Do that and this cold day is beaten, and I, Seamus Costello, have not died. Finally, comrades, I wish you all the best of luck tonight and for tomorrow's session. Hopefully, 
It will encourage meaningful debate and crucially, as always, mutual respect. Salon, Sean Doyle. That's a comment from Sean. I hope in the school. Um, he would have loved to have been here. We'll now hand us over to uh, Vincent Fagan, a comrade of Seamus Costello, who's going to chair this evening's uh, event. How's it going there? Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm very nervous about this, to be honest. I'm sweating here. But anyway, um, I, I think it's... I, I had the honour to know Seamus, and uh, we worked together pretty closely for a couple of years. Uh, we drove around all the north at the height in the 70s, which was uh, not an easy thing to do, believe me, in the early 70s. But uh, we done it. We met a lot of people, and we thought that we were on the way of, you know, doing the business at last in this republic of ours. Then, as usual, everything goes to hell. And they had to murder the man, because it was the only way they could get rid of him. And while it's right that we honour him, I think that, well, number one, I'd like to send our, our, uh, uh, our thoughts to uh, Sean Doyle, because he's not too well. And also, in the last couple of years, we've lost, lost some old comrades. Uh, Brandon O'Sullivan, who died this year, earlier this year. Vincent Ford, who struck a fantastic blow for Ireland, who died a couple of years ago. And my dear friend and comrade, uh, Frank Gallagher, who died a number of years ago, who was the, the OC of our prisons in London. Um, they say that uh, it's a Chinese curse that you say that you live in interesting times. I think these times are interesting, but I don't think it's a curse. I mean, I think the last election that we had in Northern, sorry, six counties, and now I'm starting to say Northern Ireland, I will never be a Northern Irelander. Never. I'm an Irishman. But for the first time uh, since the Unionist hegemony, there was a, a, a majority of people did not want a Unionist government. And the, the, the Loyalist Alliance that call themselves the DUP, that are strutting around Westminster thinking, they're holding the whole place to ransom. They're holding the whole of Europe, Britain, and this country to ransom. Who the hell do they think they are? It's about time they were told to get the hell out of here. And give them, well, you can give them 20 grand of a grant that they need to get the boat over. But I mean, these things aren't going to work anymore. People are not putting up on that crap anymore. And, and I personally, and this is only my personal feeling, I think the time at the moment is not the right time for armed struggle. I, 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 I'm still in principle in favour of armed struggle, but not at this time. I think there's only one struggle in Ireland at this moment in time, and that's a struggle for the whole of Ireland to get together and fight and re the reconquest of Ireland for the working people of Ireland. And on that note, I'm going to hand you over to this fantastic guy here, Dr. Ruan O'Donnell. Hey! <laughs> I won't be able to follow that. <laughs> um, but, but fortunately, I'm, I'm amongst um, friends, including many dear old friends of mine, um, close friends of mine, and hopefully new friends, and those who are interested in this thing. Suffice to say that this is a launch event, so it's not going to be a heavy academic lecture. That's not, this is not the time or place for that. Now, if I'm to reflect and be honest, I've taken part in a number of um, events organised by the is Richie Beale, the, the Shemus Costello Memorial Committee. And uh, I've said things like that in the past, but normally what I do is I, I focus on a subset of Costello's life and his life in the early years of the Irish P. And, and actually, even more so, the circumstances that led to him emerging as a figure of national and international note, um, a major loss leader, and not simply because he had the tragedy of being killed in his prime as the head of a dynamic political party that never, ever, ever, ever got a fair press in the national media. So, as a historian and uh, someone who's meant to be an academic working in Ivory Tower, I can tell you right now, if you go to the popular press for your sources, you're in for a world of hurt and anxiety. You will be offended. If you go to the archives, there's nothing there. Because for reasons I fully understand, and most people can get in a capitalist democracy, uh, you're not going to see the Department of Justice files, you're not going to see Irish Indian Intelligence files, you're not going to see all the things that they knew at the time, and will not be in a position to make a, forget about a detached assessment, you will not be in a position to make any assessment of how they acted. So, insofar as the general public have no idea why things happened and why they turn out the way they are 
and where, which is a historical fact. The causation, the processes, the rationalization is not there. Insofar as how people on the other side of the censorship fence want to uh, intuit and have to intuit, let alone uh, assess why the state acted as it did from government to government, from time to time, from phase to phase, we're never going to know. As far as I can tell, we'll all be long dead in the ground, despite my great white hope in stem cell research which I'm holding out for. Oh yeah, I intend to be here in 150 years. Uh, forget cryogenics, the, the, the electricity will fail. Um, put me down for stem cell research. Ethical, ethical. None of your harvesting nonsense. Um, we probably won't live to see the truth, insofar as the state knew it to be, or believed it to be at the time. And that in a way is disheartening. But should that stop people like ourselves from speaking to those who have knowledge, who can impart, if they wish, aspects of their experience, which is their eyewitness testimony, very high grade of evidence in a court of law, which means things have to be taken carefully in that regard, aka Boston College, Farago, and Sting Operation, in my opinion. I prefer not to be quoted on that, but there's I hinted that in two articles I wrote online, which you can get for free, you've got my name in History Ireland. Yeah. Suffice it to say that we cannot write the history that people in this room know. It doesn't mean we can't write any damn history. It's possible to put forward and defend ideologies and defend actions in a way that does not incriminate anybody. In a polity that does not have statute limitations. There's no truth in the conciliation process. And forget about the Good Friday Agreement. I'm not talking about those terms. It's a legitimate aspect of the GFA. But it isn't here. And we need something like that. Something like that with all the problematic issues that arise to get ourselves towards what actually happened and why. Now again, I know I can recognize many former, um, and indeed not just former, political activists in this room. You all know things that are not part of the public record. You all know things about Seamus Costello and the origins, the nature of the IRSP and Irish National Liberation Army that are not the public domain. Some would arguably, you know, I say this without my historian sat on me, should not be in the public domain. And the same that people don't talk about and should not talk about it, ever. But there's an awful lot that can be put out there, which can be um, a bulwark against what's left. What's left is the lies of ambitious, lying journalists. Embedded journalists who work for different agencies with different agendas and not just self-aggrandizement and self-enrichment. Uh, it can work against the, uh, the spurious nonsense that has been passed for history because it's been written 10, 15, 20, 30 years ago. It must be history, which is predicated on lies and the accusations of the enemy. Um, often, sadly, um, things stated by former comrades in the midst of extremity and the emotional disaster that is feuding. Um, and these stand for the historic record. I do think there's time to correct that. There's no golden rule how to do that, but we could talk about that as part of an ongoing process of school such as this. So I've already used up half the time allotted to me <laughs> without saying anything about the man who's the linchpin of our organizing principle, which is the inspirational and important and under-recognized lost leader, Seamus Costello. Now, I'm, I'm speaking to members of his family, his closest inner circle, some of the most diligent and loyal comrades he ever had. And I, bear, I ask you your indulgence while I outline a more simplistic view of his life in outline than is within your body of knowledge and your life experience for the benefit of those who are not from that background and are too young for it. Let's just say this. I'm going to make a few basic points about biography and I'll make some basic observations, which are all debatable. They're all debatable because we do not have an autobiography. There's a reasonable body, there's a reasonable body of text, thankfully, that Seamus um, left us because uh, it's been deeply preserved by the family and comrades. That gives us something to go on. This particular volume is a version of that. Um, it's, a, it's a tip of the iceberg, but you can look at this in due course. 
They appear to be jettisoning all the accoutrements of the table. Um, it wouldn't be hard to, to, for us to put more of the public domain in support. So here's the thing. Seamus Costello never had to be a Republican. He never had to be a socialist. He was not exactly born into poverty. His early years were spent in Bray or Um There are people who live near there who live in dire poverty, and many are borderline working poor as we, as we sit here tonight. He made choices that were dangerous and knew to be so. He was an activist from his earliest compass mentis period as a young man, as a youth. His early years coincided with the 56-62 campaign known by the veterans generally and correctly as the resistance campaign and more properly as the border campaign, which sometimes is misleading. Uh, couldn't be called the 50s campaign per se because it went from 1956 to 1962. So people like ourselves get laughed at for using incorrect terminology, not that we care. But the resistance campaign is what the veterans called it and those who fought it. Um, resistance. Sean Cronin always referred to the resistance. Oh, it was Operation Harvest. That was the JHQ term for the military side of things, but it was referred to as hence the Panther resistance, amongst other things. But we could talk about this, but it, most of those I've spoken to who conceived and launched this, including Terry Murphy, who's Adjutant General and a uh, very significant figure, uh, resistance campaign is, is the preferred term. From those who had conceived from 1948 with Tony McGann's reorganization IRA, through 1951 when they told the International Conference it was going to be a campaign, through to 53 onwards when there was deep structural alterations to the nature of the Irish Republican Army or Van Heron, and from 53 onwards, in fact, for 51, you had, you had, you had the test run at Ever Everton Barracks and Derry to acquire weaponry from the enemy, leading to the series of armories in this country and neighbour country. In 53 54, of which the single most successful was the Goth Barracks Raid. Now, Seamus Costa was too young to participate in that, but he's electrified, as far as I'm aware, on the basis of the testimony of those who are contemporaries of his, by such activities. Attempted to join the public movement, uh, initially was rebuffed because he's just too young. Now, it's not immaterial that he grew up in the brave sector, which, uh, but just by happenstance, did not then and things changed quickly because of him, did not then have the same strength and depth as certain other urban sectors, say, like, for instance, Limerick City or North Kerry. Um, Dunleary, however, was an exception. So you do have, you do have a locus of uh, structure and veterans and people you can approach if you want to do that. His initial attempts, we believe, on the basis of what he, he has deposed, uh, were in approaching well-known Republicans who had a profile within Sinn Féin and initially being encouraged to come back the next year. He did. Um, had there been a very developed then Mafina Aaron structure in Bray or Dunleary, it might have been different. But anyway, he came in at a precocity early age. Why would they want him? He was an ideal recruit, he, albeit very young, due to his uh, congenital intelligence, he's a very smart man. His maturity, uh, his youthful charisma, his acumen in many respects, his uh, good uh, tr um, knowledge of Irish history, which became extremely good by all accounts in history. And if you read his writings, it's quite clear you're looking at someone who's read widely and extensively and reflected upon it. And it's hard to find people as good as him, basically, in any given circumstance. So he joined at a time when the movement was expanding, when fewer than one in ten who applied were admitted into the ranks of Meharon. Other people were given different roles in the, in the, in the Republican movement, mm -hmm. but in terms of the cutting edge of the army and uh, those who would take the war to the enemy, it was a difficult thing to achieve. Particularly, actually, disproportionately in the sector he grew up in, where there was a very high concentration of people who were interested in actually patriotic, Republican minded. Uh, the right sort of people, and you could really, it's, 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 it's never going to sound right, you could really test and probe the right ones and, and assign different uh, contributory uh, assignments to those who weren't going to be the best. At times, in the, in the Dublin Wicklow sector, if you couldn't run five or eight or ten miles, you know, that wasn't good enough. 
Uh, so, Jesus Christ, I can't do that. I never could. <laughs> um, so, that's me banged out to helping out with leaflets or something. I don't know. But, um, a role for everybody. But he was prime material. He was a mechanic, later a salesman, very effective, extremely effective, in fact, I believe. Which tells you something. He was intelligent, he was uh, quick witted, he was articulate and convincing to those. At least, again, these are things I've been told by his comrades were the case. I, of course, was too young to have met him. Um, in theory, I could have, I was born in 1968, but it was destined not to happen. Suffice to say that he could drive, he was mechanical, he was exactly the right sort. So in this revival phase, with an active campaign looming December 56, he was good. Now, I want to summarise things very, very brutally. Things I could say a fair bit about to you, and I wish to another time, if you'll bear with me. In June and July 1956, many of you will be aware that there's a critical schism in the Dublin unit of the Ogham Heron. It's sometimes referred to as a crystal state, but it's not just that. There's other push and pull factors. At that time, Seamus um, was a member of the IRA and did not split. His innate tendency was not necessarily to go with the easy or, or obvious or militant thing. He was not an extremist. Now, I'm not saying Crystal was. I'm just saying, if you think about it, he's been trained, he can utilize firearms, he's been up in the camps, he was involved in organizing some of the camps um, as a very young guy. Uh, he didn't feel, I'm, that's for me, I'm going right now to get a crack at the Brits. It wasn't like that. Uh, he's not a, someone who instinctively broke ranks because he's some sort of eccentric maverick. Mm. Not at all. Not at all. Consistently, there is a political rationale for everything he did. And it's often a deep one. Now, no one ever makes all the right decisions all the time. And maybe he did. Maybe he did. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that he was not someone who was, you know, a Walter Mitty. He would not have been tolerating the area at the time, and he stayed with the main force. And the result was that he was up in South Derry with Pierce O'Doul and others at the cutting edge as a very young teenager, bearing primary responsibility for burning down Mackerfell Courthouse, which uh, did a power of good to the locals who supported the Republican perspective, and um, happened to be done very cleanly. Uh, the the, the uh, main target was proved uh, on reconnaissance to be a little bit awkward. And instead of going home and folding the tent, they took a secondary target and, and Shane was an instrument for making sure that was burned to the ground. And it was one of the best operations on the night of the 12th of December 1956. Now later, when Pierce O'Doul was, uh, was arrested up in the Grand Chain Pass, he had more authority than would be reasonable thrust upon him. And he did the best he could with that. It's a matter of record. He was slightly injured in the bizarre episode involving the premature detonation of uh, a grenade in a safe house. Uh, ultimately, in this jurisdiction, he was interned due to the inability of the Dublin establishment, the Irish establishment, to deal with the issues that were pressing the people at the time. Again, to, to so summarise brutally, in 1957, uh, he was part of, uh, having been arrested and released, he was part of uh, sort of a rebuild-up aimed towards a late summer re-offensive, or stronger offensive. And as is well known, 38 young, well, dare I call them young volunteers. So first of all, 38 patriots were arrested in Glen Creek. And if they'd been found in arms, things would be much more difficult than they were. But these were Republicans who did not recognize the state. The state knew that, and the state knew that arrest would not be resisted militarily due to uh, Army Order No. 8. So a lot of people went in the bag, including Bernard O'Rean, who he would have known from the Dunleary sector, a man with a very, very interesting past and an emerging future, um, a certain uh, Francesca Rossa, um, and others, and others. A mix, generally speaking, of quite experienced volunteers who've been on the border, volunteers who've been prepared to go to the border, and people who gravitated between the Fina Heron into the ranks of the Heron by the opportunity of an active campaign and natural maturation of people who were, who were hand-picked, essentially. So that was an issue. Um, later, of course, he was formally interned, where he gained the sobriquet, the boy general. And that's a famous term of reference for Seamus Costello, 
And most people now regard it entirely benignly and fondly. Uh, others not so much because you're looking at a young man with experience who had a strike, who'd been in action over the border, is now in jail with a camp staff who were certainly veterans of the Republican movement, but due to the nature of you know, their elevation, would not have had such recent experience and conditions on the ground. So he's a very credible young man, and no one ever told me that he was not opinionated, so correct me if I'm wrong, but he's certainly capable of putting his, his position forward in a camp that was divided between a fairly social conservative upper leadership, a very well-trained and active um, uh, middle cadre of uh, experienced people, and then people who hadn't really had a chance as yet to do what they wanted to do, and be frustrated by that experience of close confinement by their own army and such, um, in their own country, in their own part of their own country, in their own jurisdiction in their own country, and one can imagine how destructive that was. And that's what the government wanted. It had worked quite well from the 1940s, it worked less well in the 1950s, but when you have people like Terry Murphy orchestrating escapes against the wishes of the ex-chief of staff, you're looking at a problem. You're looking at a problem what had become a very disciplinarian internal force. Uh, they weren't brutal in terms of exercising internal discipline, but people were uh, expelled left, right and centre for very minor fractions. Things that it was different in the 70s. Different in every respect. So Costco was one of the people that came out in 1962. And the organisation phase in 1963 with a very high degree of personal respect, which he learned. Now, they didn't mean he was everybody's best friend. It can't be like that. In a broad church movement like Ogham Heron and indeed the accident within Sinn Féin and other parts of it, uh, you can't be everyone's friend if you're serious and ideological and determined. Because you're going to hold certain opinions either more strongly or less strongly than other people. So no one's ever really going to be collectively on the same page exactly. And that's the beauty, perhaps, of an umbrella organisation, mm. that you can accommodate in different sectors those mm. with different levels of skill and commitment and interest. Um, suffice to say that when McGillah and Carl Gooding assumed command uh, of the core public fronts of the broader movement within the IRA in Sinn Féin, and McGann was more or less disgraced, which should not have happened, by the way, and quite unjust, although there's issues there, and when McCurtain was absolutely disgraced, which was disgraceful. What happened to Tomás McCurtain was an absolute thundering disgrace, to paraphrase a phrase that was never used. There was an F involved in the original, I believe. Um, you have a different direction based on the experiences within the Carter and the rethink that went on there. But young Seamus Costello was instrumental. He had a major role in the quartermaster department at a time when they had a problem. Even though there was a, an active plan and which was implemented to reduce the size and influence of the Ogham Heron within the overall public movement, to reduce it ultimately towards it's been promoted a hundred volunteers, which can only really be used for internal policing and certainly not an assault in the north or indeed an assault within the United Kingdom itself. Uh, you have uh, the foregrounding of Sinn Féin as a political force, which makes a certain amount of sense and. Uh, redirect the resources towards that end, politicization, trying to stop the what they believed to be the isolation that they faced in the border counties and the of counties, to maintain some of the spirit that was flickering in places like Kerry and Limer City and parts of Dublin City at different times, in the midst of a horrible recession that is the 50s, um, Costa worked at the Watermaster Department. Now this is complicated, of course, by the controversial and premature demise of uh, Patrick McLaughlin, um, who had set up most of the newer generation units that were effective, some which ran through the 70s and the early 1980s, and for all I know beyond that. The uh, American networks were not supplying the weaponry that people like uh, Jason Collin, the hero of Brookra, and Seamus Costello, the boy general, needed to acquire for the army and to make ready for the cadre, or whatever form of the area that existed. I need to tell this room, and at times, uh, Tyrone was expelled, not for the first or last time. Uh, much of Kerry was stood down or expelled, not for the first or last time. Uh, many key figures uh, were you know, shown the road. And metaphorically, thank God. <laughs> metaphorically, my God, I never to say it. That's a falling step. But um, they were sent home. 
and you had a very uh, drastic reduction in terms of the, I suppose, the capacity of the IRA to um, initiate an armed campaign, because I think it's fair to say, on the basis of what I know and others know, and people here are part of it, can tell me more than I let know, there was actually, no, for maybe the first time in the history of Fenianism, there was no desire to enable a sitting, standing cadre be, to become capable of unilateral offence. That the focus was largely defensive and preemptive. Uh, and in a perfect world, that's lovely. But if things go wrong and pear shaped, and unforeseen things happen, like Brexit, who saw that coming for Christ's sake? Mm -hmm. uh, if unforeseen things happen, what do you got? If 66, when you, the equity found with British intelligence, leads to 68, which we've been talking about without absent truth recently, and um, becomes 69, what are you going to do? And if in 1969 you're suddenly trying to uh, land substantial quantities of weaponry from the UK, because you've burned your bridges with the Americans, the Irish Americans, too little, too late. And where are the volunteers to use them? Are you going to remobilize guys in their 30s and 40s? Well, you can, but is there a plan to do so effectively? Are you going to go around the country taking um, stripping brigade area and training area dumps and asking former comrades to hand over gear that they'd held on to since the, the 60s and, and the 50s and the 40s? That's what happened. Where did that go? Into a major command dump. And not, you know what happened to that stuff? Never used. Never bloody used. Because of a political direction by those who were at the helm of the public movement in, in 68, 69. Now, I am not saying this for the benefit of hindsight that is churlish and stupid. That's facile. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that there are people who told themselves that it's dangerous to go this direction. Now, on the plus side of the column, and I've got to finish up in a couple of minutes, or maybe an hour or so. <laughs> no worry, I won't do that to you. I won't do that to you. On the plus side of the column, there was a genuine and serious and sustained effort to make active Republicans, who were again fairly elite, engage with the issues of the Irish people. So there was genuine and actual and significant and major and unrecognised and sometimes criticised activity within the Dublin Housing Action Committee, within uh, Ben Colin Kill and the co-op in Donegal, within the EI strike down in Shannon and Limerick within the, the, the bid to stop carpet-bagging uh, persons from outside the state uh, rorting and rampaging through the west of Ireland, uh, to stop a certain type <coughs> of uh, Shawnee waster stealing our coastline. So a lot of things happened that were very effective around a cadre of ideologically committed left-of-centre Irish Republican militants. And Seamus Costa was critical to that. He had known from 1954 that something different would happen. And if you bear with me for one second, I want to bring it back to 54 when I bring it forward to my, my final few statements. He talks about his attempts to join the public movement as a youth. And he talks about the situation faced by his contemporaries in the Bray sector and indeed in, in, in the, that North Wicklow, South Dublin, the Rath Down, the Starrick Rath Down interface. And he says it's something that's worth reading for, for one or two minutes. 54. This is still the middle phase, but hadn't hit where he was. At that time, there was absolutely no Republican organisation in County Wicklow. In fact, the last period during which organised Republicans existed in Wicklow was during and for a short period after the Civil War. I'm going to be in. This meant, in effect, that when the movement was reorganised, indeed, right up to the present moment, and he's speaking in February 1969, when everything is moving, the ground is moving in February 69. And it's no easy decision to make what the best solution would be if you're the Chief of Staff or the Action General, which Seamus Costell may well have been, and later Director of Operations. That none of our members were drawn from traditional Republican backgrounds. What a thing to say. You would not be saying that in Tipperary Town, in the Stoll, in Limerick City, in Balbriggan. But in Wicklow, it, it, just, it just wasn't there. We had to start with completely new people who had no experience of or preconceived ideas about revolutionary political action. That's the blank slate that McGowan wanted. But McGowan wanted the mold of his image into a certain type of highly disciplined centralised IRA that was nothing like the IRA of the 1940s. 
I feel that this point is worth mentioning because of the effect it has on our methods of operation. So they're thinking in terms of what are we going to do? No paper comments here. No shadow members. We have been able to approach every phase of our activities with a completely fresh outlook, unhindered by any adherence to our unnecessary taboos. Except those imposed on us by belonging to a movement that has in the past, and indeed to a certain extent in the present, he's speaking as a leader of that movement, being guided in its activities by past history rather than completely different circumstances of the present. Now, you all know the things. If you want to organize to fight the last war, off you go. It's not going to work. If you're not adapted to current and contextual circumstances, forget about it. In fact, it would actually, to use a religious word, it's nearly immoral to do so. Mm. It's nearly wrong. It's unethical. If you are serious about doing these things, adapt to the circumstances of the, circumstances of the, of the time, and adapt to the correct and appropriate and reasonable tactics and strategies. Now that's what he's saying he did. Now from much of the 1960s he expended his energy trying to convince people who did not believe in electoral processes and did not necessarily recognise the Dublin government, let alone the storm regime, that engaged in electoral politics could bear fruit. He was under no illusions that Sinn Féin would sweep the board and be majority government and would dictate terms of agreement to Stormont and London. You've got to be kidding me. This is a form of armed struggle. It's a form of public political organisation with an armed element behind you, which was, he believed, and others believed, many of us believed, was absolutely necessary in 1969 and 1970. And if you don't believe that by 1972, I don't know. You got the wrong bus. Not for you. And that's fair enough. That's fair enough. But, you, but there are certain things that have to happen here. The all this is predicated by an ideology that is focused on achieving a republic of 32 county Ireland. Why? Not because it's the mantra of the Fenians. Not because people who fought in 1798, 1843, <coughs> 1848, 1867 said it must be thus. Because what is the alternative solution to get things done on the basis of modern republican democracy? In other words, for the vast majority of people can agree to have a system of governance and law, legislation, separation of church and state, independent judiciary, all those things that will work best for everybody. In some cases, you're trying to liberate bigots from their own heresy. I don't mean that in, in terms of theological terms. I'm talking about that error. It is never okay to be a sectarian supremacist. That is never acceptable. And if you believe that, you are, you're wrong. You're wrong. And you need to be disabused of that idea. And if you want to impose that bullshit on us, you're coming at us. You're coming at the great branches of ordinary people. And that is not acceptable. And there's always, always legitimate to defend against that. Defending on certain impulses. So you have a basic overarching ideological perspective which will, which will benefit 100% of the population, even if 10 or 15% of them don't realize it. Too bad. Too bad. These are described in other countries as democratic processes. But in Ireland, because of the way in which our country is stated, they have become revolutionary processes. That should never have been the case. That's on them. That's on the empire. That's on the old free state. They did this to us. How do you respond? What next? Do you line up to be sent to camps and trucks? Absolutely not. Now, people like Coslo exemplified the activist tradition in the way that was rational. And when he saw circumstances changes, changing, and he realized that it wasn't necessarily the be all and end all to achieve an army convention vote, ending abstentionism. And we just tried repeatedly in 1965, 66, and onwards at various conventions, which in those days used to happen at shorter intervals due to the lack of a media campaign. He found himself at loggerheads with other people who were otherwise very good thinking left or centre Irish Republicans. There's, no, there's nothing wrong with them, it's just that they were not responding the way he did. Now, in hindsight, history proved him, I think, correct. And some of those who loggerheads were the guests. But he made himself a pariah amongst a powerful coterie, 
And his cars were marked, I would argue, sadly, from that time, that it was never going to end well. So where would he go? Um, it's not properly researched. It's certainly not properly written about. And this is the last phase of my talk. If you don't need to bear with me. Um, <laughs> Seamus had a significant interest in the activities of the Republican movement overseas, even after the split, <coughs> the tragic and disastrous split of December 69. <coughs> Think about the timing of that. The aftermath of Bombay's speed, that awful bloody summer, leading on from the awful dire circumstances of the civil rights movement in 68, and not just 68. Our civil rights movement did not begin in 1968. <coughs> Our civil rights movement began 800 years ago, mm, yeah. and it grew sharper focus, sharper focus from the disastrous and illegal and terrible partition of Ireland, uh, exacerbated by the uh, Union supremacy cult in the north, which was going to set most people on a collision course whether we liked it or not. Now, this jurisdiction, we had the luxury of not necessarily having to say for ourselves, but we're for this, we're against that. But if you live where this man lives, if you live where other people's room lives, it's in your bloody face. And I'm just thankful that the, the lottery of life did not put me in that situation. To conclude, he was very active in devising as direct operations significant armed actions against the British establishment in their own country. And if you think about it, I guess overshadowed by the 74, 75, and then the 90s campaign for the provisionals, some of the ambition of what they're trying to do um, at the sticky end of Irish you know, Republican activity was uh, pretty far sighted. Uh, bombing the officers' mess of the parachute regiment in Aldershot weeks after those same men had uh, participated in the, in the Bloody Sunday Massacre. Uh, a sequel to the Bally Murphy massacre of August 71. That's very Fenian. I've always believed that. You know, don't get A another, get the people responsible. That's a Fenian thing. Yeah. And you see that within the IRA, and it's an important concept for those who understand the old ways, and there's somewhat esoteric aspects to that. Mm. And it is a little bit esoteric. But it has a meaning, because uh, this is what they tend to understand. <laughs> If you speak to them in their own language, in the right way, in the right time, in the right manner, they're listening. They don't give a two hoots about a squatty shot in Primbrook. They don't care. They're professional soldiers to be expended under their doctrine of uh, mission over force protection. That's, that's, that's what they want. This is why they did away with the Cultured Army of, of Malaya and replaced it with a very, very, very good professional army. And remember that, there's a very, very good professional army. These are formidable opponents who are effectively uh, infantry resourced, not to be taken on without extreme care and caution and reason. If you go and blow up their headquarters, they're going to notice. Mm. Now, I have on good authority that that was meant to be part of a number of uh, other incidents that did not come to pass. And I have on, on fairly good authority that a certain man from Bray had something to say about all of those things. Um, it caused problems for those who were running Clan Aaron, the, the political front of the official public movement in the UK at the time. And I, I, I understand that. Um, but it led to a mistake. And this is where I will finish by, by just giving you the last two minutes of what I want to say to you. I, I cannot, for my life, understand why the official public movement went on a premature ceasefire in 1972. And the reason I say I'm sure is this. They made no provision for their prisoners. Mm. Now, what Republican organization exits mm. a, a, an active campaign mm. when they have a different Republican group of greater numbers and increasing appeal, named the Provisional IRA, who are in 1971, 72, and 73 going from strength to strength. If you leave the fields when another group is that active and effective and increasingly so, uh, and you know provision for your prisoners, that's a mistake. And just think about Noel Jenkinson, think about the census prisoners in Mankesh, who at one point were ordered by Dublin to surrender the political status and go in with criminals in the H-blocks 
as it means undermining the provisional strategy and not gaining anything for themselves. And there's more to it than that, and I'm sure many people here are aware. This is a disgraceful story. Now, I'm not pointing fingers, that's stupid. I don't know who was responsible. I don't. I have an inkling. I um, won't say it here because it wouldn't be appropriate. But suffice to say that a collective leadership was out of tune with the circumstances, not just in Ireland, not just the six counties, but in Belfast. In Belfast. The cockpit. So, obviously, people like James Costello did not support that, being deeply contextual, deeply rooted. And I think from that point onwards, there's going to be some form of uh, reckoning. Um, I know for facts, well, I, unless I've been deceived by those who perform those such things, that he, he had tense discussions with people he respected within the provisional movement to see could something work out. Um, and if you look at the way in which when, in December 1974, formally, on the anniversary of the disgraceful executions of the, 8th of, uh, the Feast of Mac Conception, 8th of December 1922, mm. when Bellows, mm. McKelvey, and their comrades, O'Connor and Barrett, were done to death by former comrades, an atrocity that has never been properly acknowledged, and that be might be, with this particular anniversary coming up, on that particular day, you have the formal launch of what became the IRSP, and an inkling that there's something else going on as well. Now, as, as always happens with things, there's meetings before meetings, and meetings after meetings, and meetings beside meetings, and that's just how these things happen. But this is the date we have uh, gifted to us by posterity. At that point, look at the level of transfer in the Lower Falls, in Divis, in Derry, and other areas of the on-the-ground active service units of the hitherto official IRA, look at the take-up. Look at the take-up for this new direction. Now, clearly, Costa had reason to believe that this would be the case. And the campaign he waged on the early years, the Irish National Liberation Army and their comrades in the Irish Republican Social Party, the, the Fight, the fight that they waged was really the one that the official Republican movement had been waging hitherto. But knocked themselves out of the game, locked themselves out of the game in 72, except in so far as disastrously they diverted into things that were not worthy of the ideology of a social Republican movement. Tragically, the baptism of the or IRSP, IRLA, although they weren't using that term right away, was one of tragedy and uh, loss and loss of opportunity, of misunderstanding, of callous murder, of opportunism and chance. And all these capricious elements set in stone a rather stark countdown to the ultimate assassination of James Costello. And even to this day, I, 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 had to, I had to hold my breath for half an hour and then click on the button to check the Wikipedia site today to see what's latest said about James Castle. Even today, if you look at it, there's still sort of argument toss whether or not a certain man from South Armagh actually shot Seamus and how that circumstance came to be. Um, no one in this room needs uh, instruction on why that happened. Um, once a particular other leading figure had been severely injured, some of that was very likely. But one could argue that once Billy McMillan had been killed, something significant was going to happen. And you don't hear Hugh Ferguson's name mentioned very often. You don't hear other names mentioned very often. And this is something I find great difficulty talking about publicly because it's just bloody upsetting and there's no upside to it. So on that dismal note, I'll finish on this. Seamus Costello was showing signs of being an absolutely inspirational revolutionary leader because he had a terrific grasp for propaganda of the deed that was both legal, semi-legal, and absolutely illegal. <laughs> he could represent those viewpoints very cogently. He made a very famous appearance at the Amherst Conference referenced by Sean Doyle, um, which uh, stunned everybody. 
Um, I've met a few people who are at that over the years, and these are ordinary civilians uh, who, who happen to be there because they're in Irish studies in America, and uh, he was a sensation. Uh, the UDA were there, still a legal organization, despite their mass murder campaign against ordinary nationals in the north. Um, so people like Andy Terry didn't have much to, to say about Seamus Costello. Um, to conclude, this is a sad talk. I hope I haven't been depressing. But I will say this, that many of the writings of Seamus Costello reign um, perfectly true today. And I'm going to finish off by reading something that he actually drafted for a speech in, in Mayo in 1966. Okay? At the unveiling of an Irish memorial to the uh, North Mayo Brigade, as opposed to West Mayo, Brian Collin, Mayo was heavily involved in these things, of course, attended by General Tom McGuire, then the most, the most significant, uh, well, in terms of rank, survivor of the Second Doll, but at that point, not the only one. Uh, since then, others have died, right? But McGuire was quite a guy for reasons that are not fully recorded. And um, let me see if I have this. I, I appear to have lost. Here we go. Now, just think about this. He's saying this in 1966 when there's no IRA campaign. When Sinn Féin were doing quite well with a modernized night Irishman, and there was a fair bit of pretty productive engagement in social politics and social activism. And that was going well. But what they didn't see is the juggernaut of unionist fascism coming down the road in the way that it did once they began to move into the next phase of uh, street mobilization in the six counties. He said this, they tell us that we are free, and we are free, provided a British army of occupation in Ireland comes within our idea of freedom. We are free provided that we accept that a divided country as being the ideal that Connolly, Pierce and their comrades fought and died for. We are free provided we accept the use of the infamous Offences Against the State Act against the sons of men who fought side by side with Clark, <coughs> Connolly and the others. We are free provided we accept the right of a secret political police force to harry or persecute Irishmen and Irish women who are opposed to the selling of our assets to foreign speculators and the occupation of our country by foreign troops. We are free to provide that we accept the right of a secret political force to incite ordinary policemen to batten a peaceful procession through the streets of Dublin with the same batons that we used for the DMP to shed the blood of Irish workers in 1913. We are free to provide that we accept economic subjugation, subjection to any foreign power with the consequent evils of emigration, unemployment and sheer poverty. The Ireland of today is a tattered, bedraggled interpretation of freedom. 1966. Seamus Costello was an amazing last year. Uh, that was brilliant. Uh, does anyone have any questions or uh, anything to talk about? Where you go, sir? Uh, yeah, right. So, um, it's uh, 1970. So, was he mentioned? Just uh, a thought has been 